let my only child get a peek at what that bitch has done. Do you understand me? Mother said. Yes, ma'am, I, I do. Father peeped. But we ain't been able to give. Mother turned upon those words. I, I mean, I, I haven't been able. We. I give my child everything that is necessary, which is more than I ever had or have. To fit under the basin of water, I had bent and folded my body. The basin sat upon a table in the kitchen's corner. My father built it to hold the basin that would hold water for kitchen use. I was too old to be spying. I liked to sit under the basin, because in August days the basin would sweat, and I would squat and let the basin sweat drip down my father's table legs, then onto my back, where I wished just once it would cool me. But it merely got me wet. And I didn't mean to be snooping. I was crouching and getting wet by myself before she stormed into the kitchen. I wasn't spying. What did she mean she gives her child everything that is necessary? All she seems to have is a sweaty water basin. Yes, ma'am. I mean, with the Murphy farm looking like it's going dry. I haven't been able to give him much, Father said. That bitch has been missing for months, and she returns and lays a litter under the stoop expecting us to take care of them so she can go tramping around hell again. Mother worked her voice. She's just a pup herself. I, I don't know if... And you want to help her and yourself by presenting those sweet pups in grand fashion to your unfortunate child. Mother controlled her voice. They won't stay pups. I just thought. You just thought. I'll tell you what you just thought. You just thought you would take our glorious plumbing out of this kitchen, bend your oh-so-sore back, reach under the stoop and rip those pups from that bitch's nipples. The next, you thought you would go up behind the barn where you play John the Baptist. With hunched shoulders, my father walked across the kitchen to the basin. He spied me but didn't look me in the eye. He mewled as he cradled the basin in both of his working arms and hauled it outside, behind the barn. With the basin gone, my hiding place was not so successful. Well, now I know it's not a hiding place. I'm uncertain. Do you think the water comes out of the bottom? Mother said. No, ma'am, I managed to say, though I don't have her control. You know, you make it difficult to love you when you're sneaking about. Mother said. I didn't understand. Was that a question? Hey, Ma, I don't understand the question. Yes, ma'am, I answered. She would knock me if she, if she heard me thinking in my head how I, I call her Ma. We are not local people. Do our clothes look local? I am your mother, not your Ma. Close your mouth. She rolled her eyes in slow frustration. For deliberately misunderstanding and for eavesdropping on our conversation, you will assist your father for some re-education. I tried to race out from underneath my father's table to make it to the door, to make it to my father. But I had to stop, dear Tom. Who will you be? Mother quizzed. Sometimes I give people quiet sass that they cannot hear. I blink twice at my mother. I learned that that is how lame children say their words, by blinking. Mother didn't hear my sighs. You won't be John. You'll be... I didn't answer. My mouth fell open again. She'd had enough. Her frustrated rolling eyes altered to head shakes of disbelief. Go help your father. I shot through the door and jolted for the barn. When I came around the corner of the barn, my father was standing in the basin with his pants rolled up. Just standing. Before he saw me, I crept backward and slipped inside the barn. Huh. They called it a barn, however. It was a shack to cover a few stalls and tools. It was already there, crooked and waiting when they forced us to that place. I soon discovered that I had a loft where I could be alone. I crept up into the loft so I could look through the uneven planks and watch my father without being seen. 
when I found the right crack to look down on my father. He was bending over and gently lifting handfuls of water, then opening his hands, letting it dribble, making a soft sound inside the basin. Then cut the water, dousing the crown of his head over and over. He let it drip down his entire length, from his head, his ears, his back, his privates, and down to just below his knees where it flowed back into the basin. I thought I could see so much from up in the loft, though imagine if it were a real barn with actual paint and maybe an advertisement on it like the, like the Murphy barn. I couldn't see that far because that's, that's seven miles away. Father told me, he knows because he walks there seven days a week to work. Well, at least he used to. Now he just goes six days a week like all the other men. When he used to go on that seventh day, he would do women's work. In the beginning, Mrs. Murphy had him do a little fixing and mending inside the Murphy home. There was nothing to do after the first few visits, so... Mrs. Murphy said he could find something to do in the barn, or if there was nothing to do there, he could go home. He went to the barn to clean the mess from the other six days of work. He said it would make a little extra money that would help us buy our fields back. He also liked clean. But then Mr. Murphy said he didn't want my father for the Sunday work anymore, and he should send my mother. She would be better equipped to do that work, so we could still make the extra money to buy back our fields. And since Mother recited us the book herself, we didn't have to be at church in the morning. She read to us much later then, after she finished inside the Murphy barn. I had been in the Murphy barn, but never got to go in their loft and see how far I could look out. One time I had to go with mother on a work day, forced to go as a re-education. I had snuck out and met some town kids in the well after dark. But when we were in the barn, Mr. Murphy came in and said, A young lad shouldn't be inside on such a fine day, eh? Now, why are you here? His father is punishing him for misbehaving. His father? Mr. Murphy sounded surprised. Yes, his father. His reaction to a minor misbehavior was extraordinary. Mother couldn't. When father told me of the punishment, mother was the one to object, which I didn't understand. She's the one who pushes for re-education. Yet, she seemed to back down and said she agreed, which I didn't understand even more. She would argue anything, even if, even if everyone were on her side. One time, Father said he was going outside to shave our two sheep, and Mother said, Shave the sheep? Why not shave the chickens? I did not comprehend this. Did, did she want him to pluck the sheep? Well, son, Isabella is outside. How about I stay and help your mother clean this muckster? After all, this is my mess. And we won't tell your father that you got let off your punishment. Mr. Murphy smiled at me and then turned and smiled at my mother. My mom. I knew better than to answer for myself. Mother seemed relieved that she wouldn't have to see me serve my re-education. You play nice with Isabella. Treat her like a little lady. She said, please for me. The mother that I loved bent down for a kiss. As I was on her cheek, I whispered, I love you, mother. And I raced out to find Isabella. If I had stayed and climbed into the loft of the Murphy barn, I wondered if I, I would have been able to see the well in town or St. Philip in the field or Mr. Wainwright's shop. From my father's loft, I could see these things. But from Murphy's barn, even though it was the biggest building I'd ever seen, I'm not sure if I, I would have seen these things seven miles away. At the same time, I was seeing all these things from my family's loft. 
I also saw my father step out of the basin and walk back toward the house to reach under the stoop to do his business with the pups. Now that their mouths were off their ma's teeth, I could hear the pups squeals and unpracticed barks. Then from the loft, I saw the mother dog running, stopping, sniffing, then run forward, stop, sniff, go backward, jolt, sniff, roll, run circles, ecstatic with being free of her duties. The only time her tail stopped whipping was when she slowed down to make water. Even from up in the loft, I felt I could see the redness subsiding from her raw belly. Then father returned with an armful of her pups, and I could only see the dirt she kicked up as she bolted. It appeared to be their first excursion out from under the house. His father was rolling up his sleeves to match his pant legs. The pups sniffed up everything. A few slapped their puppy breath tongues against my father's face when he bent over to reaffirm his pant legs. I could see him breathe through his nose, deep and slow, savoring the puppy's breath, staying down at his cuffs for longer than he needed to, letting the pups climb on the backs and heads of one another falling back down my father's legs and clambering back up their brothers and sisters just to have my father judge whose puppy breath was the fairest. Father reached over and dipped his arm into the water basin. It shot back out. Furrows rolled across his forehead and thinking, the water might be too cold. He tapped the galvanized basin with his bare foot. No holes in the He looked up and caught sight of the wheelbarrow. Father walked over to the barrel, tripping over the pups that were licking and nipping at his bare legs and salty feet. The wheelbarrow checked out. That wheel sure is true. He walked over to the new field fence that let us know where our property now stopped. The pups made certain to inspect everything and all was safe wherever he walked. Father grabbed one of the fence posts to see if the fence had loosened up any. Still stiff and strong. It was good. Mr. Murphy had my father build the fence with his own hands, and he always does quality. He walked back toward the basin. Some pups licked at the sweat on the outside of the water basin as Father detoured to the barn door. Still seems to open and close as it always has, but the hinges seem to make a bit of noise. The pups love that noise. The ears pricked up, and if their tails had been long enough, they would have whipped with ecstasy. Father's forehead corrugated again. Barn door is no good if it squeaks. Determined, he picked up his pace, stepped strongly back to the house. He told the pups something, something oil. Barn door something, something, right back. Something. I imagine my ear could not register the tuning my mother belted out. All I heard were crashing and peaking tones. If there were words, they sounded as if they had been choking underwater. Then those words washed down the stoop through the yard, greasing the hinges up to the loft, out the cracks, and then caught up to the mother dog. The dirt settled when the bitch froze. Without stopping to fix the barn door hinge, my father stooped down and grabbed a pup, and in this movement, he glanced upward toward the top of his barn to the loft. At me? Or was he seeing if there was some crack to disappear through? All this in that flash of a movement. Then the first pup's nails made a muted scratching on the water basin's bottom. The other pups came sniffing to see what their brother was doing. The basin water turned a pale shade of chalk cherry. That's when father snapped his arm out of the basin, looking wide-eyed at his newly tattered shirt sleeve and underneath to his gouged and punctured arm. The pup probably had no feelings about father not wanting to get his sleeves wet. The pup just pulled and unfolded and then ripped the sleeve down when he decided to fight. A pup would fight. He did not know why or wherefore, but he just did fight. The brothers and sisters had shied away. 
But they all bounded back when Father offered his wounded arm. They all thought, this is more like it. They licked his flesh again as they had done before. A little saltier this time. One less mouth to compete against. The fighter pup, too small to reach and pull himself up, was paddling around in circles inside the basin, letting out panicked yips. He frantically tried digging his nails into the sides. Fast at first, then gradually slower and slower still. Then they stopped altogether as my father, using his free, undamaged arm, palmed the exhausted pup's head in his hand and dunked him down until there was no point in dunking him any longer. My father had pups on one arm, licking and romping and tramping around while their brother was being worked on the bottom of the basin. Then, while still palming his quarry, he raised his dunking undamaged arm out of the basin. The runt did not shake his loose skin dry as a living wet dog does. Its bum dangled down between my father's thumb and forefinger, and the newborn head draped over my father's palm, with water pouring in silky streams out of the still warm nostrils. If father could only get the kitchen plumbing to work like that, perfect and smooth. He looked around for a place to set the body. He looked at the other pups. All pups are jumpy. They flinched and jolted as they heard the splash that their limp brother made when father tossed his body back into the basin. All pups are forgiving. Deciding the sound of the splash was no danger to them, they pranced back to my father's offered arm. My father grabbed the next pup by the tail, spun it in two quick circles, and wham bammed its head on the basin's lip. The other pups barely flinched at this new noise. They were too busy with puppy misbehavior. How could they think the unnatural noises were meant for them when father was offering his salt to wound? The spun pup went a lot easier. It didn't molest father's arm at all. A thing that's difficult to do after being stunned senseless. When father raised the finished body above the basin to check his work, blood, not water, streamed out both of the pup's soft nose holes. From the nose spigot, blood flew and formed an arc as he threw the pup and a cart went back inside the basin to join the half-submerged brother. Now, it was father who flinched. His eyes went saucer wide as he stretched and warped his face when he felt the cast-off blood spatter him from the throat. He held his arms stiff, down and out to his sides, not wanting to touch himself. The pups went back to work avoiding the new arm, preferring the salted one. He flinched again, harder this time as their loving puppy tongue touches. I could tell that everything was making him anxious, all the yapping and the second flying cart whip pups blood running down his face, collecting in a big drop at the bottom of his stubble chin. He brought his raked arm up to his face and wiped the blood before it dripped into the basin. He only wiped that drop then returned to his pose. Now the pups could taste the blood of my father and their siblings as one. Two floating in the basin and of what remained I could not count. They looked like one feral fur beast swarming on my father's arm. My father started whipping his head between floating pups, swarming pups, basin pups, arm pups. From the house, I heard my mother's voice washing out to where my father was. Her cackle flowed wet with anger. His arm was a hunting hive that held this swarm floating, swarming. In one fluid arc of his arm, the rest of the litter was in the basin. Without rolling up his clothes, he went baptizing. There were yips and whimpers and nail scratches and bone crunches. There were noises underwater that did not translate well above water. Father sat pushing himself down, spread eagle inside the basin, shifting his buttocks, readjusting his back, slamming his thighs together when, when he felt a pup trying to catch a breath. The pup would only catch a smack. That's when I slunk down out of loft to go, to go, well, somewhere not there. I crept down to the barn door. That noise the door made as I pushed through sounded like the underwater pumps. If that mistranslated noise, 
my father turned in my direction. I squawked over and sucked in fast when I saw the scene up close. The pups in the basin with my spread eagle father. Not all of them were floating. There were crushed ribs, some light deflated, millstones on the bottom. Another was only a puppy head that I could see. Open maw, elongated dangling tongue, eyes bulging from the pressure of my father's buttocks that hit its body. For a moment, my father lost the drunken look and almost looking me in the eye said, that door should not sing. Then back to the slack jaw glaze. The screen door screamed open, bounced once loudly, and then twice quietly as it settled into place. Footsteps hammered down the stairs. The hammering on the stairs turned to scudding across the ground. Hearing the steps approach, I could see Father waking from his drink. In the basin, all breath stopped. The footsteps slowed to a shuffle as Mother took it all in. Water, air, and shuffle stilled. Mother threw no curses. She stood rigid, tight-lipped, sober stare. She blinked. She blinked again deliberately at me. I see you're here. Thank you for helping your father. It helps us love you. I looked down and shuffled my boots around, hanged all. Then she spoke to my father. And you? Are you doing this to mock me? No. Father said quick and sober. That quick answer snuck up on her. Governing her control, she said. I don't see the humor. Is this some joke I'm not understanding? No. Father said flatly. Then were you trying to turn this into a game for your son? The water rippled. He was losing his sneaky courage. Father finally peeped out. No. She halted her attack. Mother paced over to me and placed her hands on my head. My mom. Did your father tell you about the game he played with Mr. Murphy? Her hands, that were now always busy baking, that she could never get completely clean, stuck as the pie filling mixed with my hair. Father and Mr. Murphy played a game? I tried to act surprised. I had hidden behind a dirt pile once at Murphy's and remembered hearing Mr. Murphy say something about a game, but I never caught on how to play. Yes, yes, Father said as he flopped himself out of the basin. I was just making it a game for the kid. I was wrong. I just thought a game. Such a... He just petered out. I didn't understand. The talk, the game... The kid, the petering out, I didn't understand. My mother looked at me and was saying something about love me, when suddenly father slammed in, children aren't the only ones who play games. My mother's eyes went extraordinarily wide, her lips were not so tight, and her stare was not so sober. That's when I went. As I approached Murphy's farm, I thought it would be my feet that would be sore. But it was my back that I continued to readjust, to stop the throbbing, the pulsing. I lurked around, doggish, trying not to scuff my boots on the Murphy dirt. Sometimes you don't want people to spy you when you get here. And here it was dark. It was a long way. It was long enough to have the sun go away. But Isabella shone brightly, high up, framed in her oversized window. I could see her saunter back and forth. She couldn't see or hear me in my feather boots. But the animals? I could hear them hearing me. They called, barked, and brayed. They smelled a wet, dead dog, and their eyes rolled around inside of their heads in fear. The Waterbury Glee Club didn't make such a noise singing all their songs off key. I needed to duck down before someone got curious and shined a light down and spied me spying. I felt my insides grind when I witnessed a pie sitting on the Murphy front porch. It looked like some old wife's trap, 
But I'd walk so long, all day with no food, and never got to taste pie at home. Inside my feather boots I snuck. It was mine. I broke from the Murphy barn, knowing they keep no fertile mess-making animals inside that would further the alarm. I finally would taste and savor my mother's efforts in peace and cleanliness. I slipped through the doors. The hinges didn't even mule. Inside, I don't know where the suggestion of light came from. Even though I couldn't see the thing in so little light, I could feel a mass of something. I could feel bailing wire tangled around rusty shears. I knew the hole lay crooked in the vise, not fixing itself. There was manure underfoot that I hadn't dragged inside with me. Spilled horseshoes, nails scattered, spreading a lockjaw sickness. My scurried about leaving pellets on lamb's wool that should have already sold at the market. Did mother miss a day? I cradled the pie against me while trying to see feel with my free hand. I discovered the ladder. With one hand and two feet, I awkwardly climbed the sanded smooth rungs and found myself in the Murphy loft. Dark again. But the distance the height created calmed the animals. They were no longer screaming. I sat and ate my pie and thought about everything. Christ, the animals. My view from the loft would have been good, but the light was so faint. The dimness only highlighting the mess inside, penned in by Murphy's walls. Goodbye. I scooted to the back of the loft and tried to find cracks in the outer wall. Some place where the planks didn't join properly, so I might look out and see what the Murphys could see. But there were no cracks. My father's were. And even if there were cracks, my walk had taken so long it was as dark outside as it was in. I finished the entire pie. I shuffled back to the inside edge of the loft. Even from way up there, I could feel the muss. Poor mother. I guess it's tough on her, having to put up with all these men. Father, making her look at all of them dead pups. Myself. What? What business of yours is out of my farm? Mr. Murphy spat. You ever see me sneaking around town? He halted, looked over the heaps to the bottom of the loft ladder, pushed his look up to the wood and then to me perched up in his loft. He caught my eye. Between a squat and a stand, I froze at the top of the loft ladder pie flakes scudding out of my open mouth. We stared at one another for a while, both catching our breath. I saw a silhouette of Mr. Murphy down on the ground, surrounded by his muss of a barn. He had to crane his neck hard to watch me up in his good view of a loft. It came out so soft on his breath. Boy, out of my loft now. No, sir, I finally peeked. Through the pail, we looked at one another, up and down. After another while, after feeling safe up high in the loft, I said, Mr. Murphy, why do you do what you do? My mouth stopped hanging open. Mr. Murphy looked up more. Then he wagged his head back and forth. Boy. He walked over to the loft ladder. Even in the darkness, he knew where to put his hands and feet. I could tell Mr. Murphy would play no games. I would not be his plaything. I would have pulled down his sleeves if I could have reached. Instead, I shoved my fingers down my throat and purple, black, and blue cascaded down the loft ladder, smoothly streamed and splattered down upon Mr. Murphy. He just backed off the ladder didn't even wipe himself. Boy, choke cherry pie, is that all you got? 
he licked one of his lips. You know, that's the first time I ever tasted one of them miserable things. He spat. He breathed a while and finally said, You know, that gun of yours is going to run empty. And what are you going to bring down on me? I needed to stick up for my family. I said the first thing that came into my mind. I'll bleed your pork. Mr. Murphy's head changed directions. Slowly wagged up and down, down and up. You don't even have a blade, boy. I thought he was agreeing with me as he shook his head up and down a little faster. I would shave your chickens, too. What the hell did I just say? Mr. Murphy arched his eyebrows. And then, and then I'll piss on your porch. What was I saying? Mr. Murphy blinked at me then. Was he sassing me? I didn't care. I was working him hard. And after I bled your pork and shaved and pissed, I'll hang your cattle. His head was going all around now. Up, right, down the left, right up, down. Is that all I have? Lynching some currency around the neck. For all his mussing around. Can I even do that? Boy, your thief dinner's drying up. You stop flippity Jim, and come down and take it proper. No, sir. I didn't mean to game you. No, sir. Definitely not game it. I take the deepest breath I can before I dive in. Maybe one day, when you're off doing your business, I'll come and throw a rock at Isabella's window and she'll look out and see me standing in the light shining down and she'll come down and her eyes won't roll around in her head because she'll be catching my eye. Then Isabella will wrap her fingers around my wrist and pull me along with her and we'll walk along not scuffing or tripping and we'll go out to your dying cotton field. But we'll bring our own cotton. Your daughter will wear it on her back. Then Isabella will slip off her dress and place it laid out on your dying dirt. Then she'll take both my wrists and lower me down. And while I'm stretched out upon her cotton, she'll walk above and straddle me standing straight up. And that light will come down again and shine through her privates. Then I'll take these two hands she held by the wrist to lower me down, and I'll bring them up to the light. I'll cut my hands together and catch her water dripping down. Then with my hands cupped, holding Isabella's water, I'll shove Isabella off from straddling me and run back into town. And I'll pass my house and St. Philip in the field and Mr. Wainwright's shop not spilling a drop from my hands. And then I'll come to the town well and I'll raise my hands over the well and drop by drop I'll put Isabella's water inside and then Mr. Murphy, this whole town will know the Murphy's hell. My throat so dry. Now Mr. Murphy's staring at me, glazed and drunk. He sobers and peeps, not like my father, but harsh. Boy, you're still in my loft, and now I'm going to bring hell down upon you. Mr. Murphy puts his hands and feet in place and starts up the ladder, catching himself when he slips on my mess I left on his rungs. I have no more ch cherries to heave, so I scuttle back and crouch against the farthest wall of his loft. My throat so dry, if I only had some water. Mr. Murphy's closing in. I drink so much, I would probably drown myself. I try again to find a hole or a crack. It sure would be nice to see something from this view. Yet, I find none. Maybe it's too dark to let in the light. Maybe it's too dark to let in the light.